John Thacker is a writer, advisor, and event producer. For 40 years, he has traveled the world looking for live examples of what a sustainable future can be like. He writes about these stories online and in books. He uses them in talks for cities and business. He also organizes workshops and festivals where project leaders share experiences with each other. John is the author of a widely read column at designobserver.com and of the best-selling book, In the Bubble, Designing in a Complex World. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next speaker, John Thackeray. Thank you, thank you. Do I need to turn this on? Does this turn itself on? Can you hear me? Do I have to turn it? I have to use my voice. Ah, okay. It's nearly as clever as that tree chopping down machine. Uh, so, a bit of a change of uh, pace and framework um, because we've had some very uh, interesting presentations about what could be considered to be the traditional tasks of design, which is improving the, uh, the objects and the products that come into our lives. I wanted to step back before lunch to look at the bigger picture about the nature of the world that we're living in and the kind of economy that we might want to have for our own futures and for our children's futures, um, and uh, some different ways in which design might be able to be part of this unfolding different picture. Um, and I wanted to start because I, I haven't been to Rovaniemi before. I've been to Helsinki many times. Um, but everywhere I go in my travels, I see a kind of trend happening, which is that developments that are somehow come from some mysterious other world um, arrive in people's backyards to shock them. So here in Venice, just as a, a recent example, in the last four or five years, the people of Venice who've been living in this kind of lagoon, fishing, trade, and so on for six or seven hundred years, their lives have been transformed by the arrival of these monstrous cruise liners. And nobody can remember uh, making a decision that, uh, to bring these liners in. They kind of just arrived one day. Um, and when I say they, it began with one or two, but now we're up five, six a day, and the number if the economy supports them, will set to increase. Gigantic uh, otherworldly machines, not so different to what you might see in a film about you, know, something coming from another galaxy, arriving in this uh, very kind of long, settled, always changing uh, context, but basically literally blind to what they uh, have come to see. So the, the passengers stand, for the most part, on the ships. Only a few of them come onto the shore. Um, and what does that mean? Does that mean uh, their lives are basically it's like being an ant uh, being looked at by people uh, in an ant farm. This great gigantic machine is beyond the comprehension. But the one thing you can say about the machine is that it uh, destroys steadily the hydraulics and the ecosystem of the lagoon, which was the kind of living system upon which Venice was founded. And nobody seems to know who is responsible for this kind of uh, arrival of these gigantic uh, cruise liners. They're part of something called the global cruise tourism industry. And because nobody made a decision for it to happen, and now they're faced with a catastrophe to the hydraulics of their lagoon, the living systems, everything from the phytoplankton up to the mussels and the clams upon which the fishing industry depends, it's too late for them to say, oh, well, this, maybe this was not a good idea, because it was never an idea in the first place. It was just slowly, steadily, on a global scale, tourism expanded to uh, the point where you have this phenomenon in Venice. So I know that tourism is a huge part of the economy here, for the most part rather small at the moment, but very, very big. Every time you read a kind of economic development document or you look at a presentation about the future of this region, Tourism is one of the two big stories that you see. Um, what you don't see is any possible uh, picture of what it would be like in 10, 20, or 30 years' time if these little rates of growth continue to infinity. But you could be damn sure that every single person in every tour company looks forward to next year being better than this year, which is exactly how, for the last 200 years in Venice, they've looked at it. We want more tourism until right now when they said, by the way, we have too much 
uh, we are going to be killed by this kind of latest development. What can we do about that? And then, I don't know if this is a bit washed out, the other story that uh, one is told, and I've had some fascinating meetings in the last few days and before I came, this is another invisible story, um, Lapland, the whole Arctic region as a mineral and trading resource of a completely different order to that which has been before, thanks to climate change. So um, what this, I, Pavey gave me this lovely map, sort of bird's eye view, looking down on the Arctic Circle, uh, which is, to most of us, certainly to me, an unusual perspective. You see very few pictures in any of the press of the world. Very rarely do you see this in the uh, kind of business papers or in the economic papers. The one place you do see these uh, kinds of images are in the maps of mining companies and shipping companies. So the gigantic resource flows that have been thought about for 10 or 15 years in the offices of shipping companies, the major mining companies, and the banks and the investors who think in terms of the extractive industries as the kind of the, the red blood, the red meat of the economy, they for sure have been looking at this picture for a long time, but in quiet places, not where we are often invited. And on the left there, you can, I don't know if you can see it so clearly, it's just one. I looked for like 15 minutes to find a kind of mineral map of uh, Finland. It's just one that's on the internet. There are many more uh, out there in many, many different offices. That does not show human settlement. It shows the settlement of minerals and resources, rare materials of different kinds that they can see now from the sky. Every square meter of this country has been mapped by physical and remote means to identify the potential for things to be dug out of the ground. So insofar as we're talking about the future economic sort of patterns of this region, those are the big picture stories. And it's normal that we say, oh my God, this is all globalization, gigantic corporations, enormous sums of money at stake, far too big in scale for any individual or a small country to deal with. Uh, that was, I think, true for most of our lives, but it is beginning, becoming less true now. So what I want to do in my talk this morning is to show how things of a radically different scale, the small, the local, the connected, and the grounded, do have and indeed are having around the world the potential to be an alternative model of economic development to the gigantic ships that come and sort of destroy the sea or the mining interests that come and do what they're going to do. And there for two reasons. One is that although it may have been true for most of the sort of last hundred years that the, the back story of the industrial economy was invisible, we didn't really know where the copper came from in Africa for our radios and televisions. We didn't really ask too many questions until the last period about where the, you know, the, the kind of the materials for our mobile phones or our washing machines or our cars or our forest digging devices. That was, so to speak, somewhere else. But that's one of the beauties of a world which is becoming connected, not just by machines, but also by people, is that the uranium mines of uh, eastern Russia or the different places in the world where massive resource extraction of the kind that is planned for Finland takes place, they're no longer out of sight and out of mind, thanks to the work of photographers, of geographers, of scientists, of activists, of indigenous peoples. These stories can no longer be kind of quietly left for somebody else to worry about. The, the impact on our lands of uh, resource extraction are no longer hidden, so we can no longer pretend, oh, we didn't know. But the good news is that uh, we have now a change in the trajectory which has been evolving over the best part of 200 years, and we're living at this kind of cusp, a sort of transition from an extractive economy, a kind of resource-burning economy, to something different. So the four parts of my talk after that um, little introduction is something called the metabolic rift, a very short explanation of why it is that we as intelligent creatures should have even considered trashing the planet in the first place with the economy. Secondly, try to suggest a different geographical model of how we think about our futures away from very abstract notions of economic areas or um, uh, sort of markets or states towards the bioregions where we all live in different ways. And then the main part of my talk is going to be how can we reconnect people to the living systems upon which we all depend? What are the different things that are happening in our lives that uh, 
show us reconnecting with something which we have lost. And then finally, how to amplify and accelerate that process, which is, as I'll explain at the end, very much a kind of task that designers are going to play a central role in. But the last presentation just was well-timed. Maybe I'm really not here to have an argument about logging, but one of the things that has transformed my life in the last five years was in Halifax, Nova Scotia, when I was taken to an old-growth forest by some people who do something called restoration forestry, uh, and just given a kind of an education in the difference between a managed modern industrial forest and one that has different time scales in the way that evolves. It's a complicated story. It doesn't really lend itself to being shown in a picture, but the basic story about an old forest with its different stages of development is that over hundreds of years, it kind of comes and goes, but the death of trees is an essential part of the the feeding of the forest itself. So the multiplicity of different kinds of vegetation, trees, plants, hundreds of different kinds which evolve and come and go through the, through the ages, is part of the forest as a kind of living system in which it's no longer, it does not depend on external inputs. And, but where, if you change your time frame as a forest manager, you can take trees out of it and make a very healthy business. It's just you don't do so with an industrial frame of mind with words like, you don't use words like productivity or game to describe it. You describe it more like a kind of gardening and long-term stewardship in which wood is taken out. But this, I said, well, wh why doesn't everybody in the world treat their kind of patch of land in the same way that you treat your forest? I said, this is the wind horse farm in Canada. And they said, well, basically because we are just literally blinded as a culture and a society to the existence of natural systems, never mind the fact that we depend on them for our lives. So the modern age has been the creation of language, the creation of media, the creation of symbolic methods of communication, and a bigger and bigger explosion of very shiny, glossy distractions um, to disconnect us from the lived physical reality of the natural systems upon which we all depend. You can't really, I mean, you, I know a lot of Finns tell me, and they told me constantly over the last two days, we are very much more in touch with nature than you people in the south of Europe because look over this nature around us. Yes, but Finnish universities and education and design schools are absolutely at the head of the class in the world in dealing with abstractions and strategies and concepts which are not viscerally connected to living systems. So you may have a lot of physical nature around, but in terms, like everybody else, the kind of culture as a whole has separated itself off um, from the nat natural system. This is not, a, I'm part of this, it's not a, saying it's bad or good, it's just describing what for the last two or 250 years has been our whole culture. We're so self-absorbed by the things that we have made, by our own media, our own sort of pictures of reality, that we are, so to speak, it's kind of collective hallucination. We don't see what's happening to the ground beneath our feet which is why phenomena such as this in China, the growth of cities out of what used to be wetlands or biodiverse bits of territory can happen within literally a few years uh, because the development system, in the same way that the sort of logging industry or the building cities industry or the building cars industry, they have to grow to survive. They cannot, because of the nature of the economy, go at a steady pace. They have to grow to, to survive. Therefore, everything associated with the man-made world expands in that way. In such a way, so here is where we've got to. So I, talk, I keep repeating that we're talking about a long period of time. Supposing we make a nice, neat 10,000 years calendar and go back to the time when people were living on the land, even before formal agriculture, in very round numbers, a man called Earl Cook did these calculations in the 1970s, in round numbers, a hunter-gatherer person moving around the, the territory with their family would need and use about 5,000 kilocalories of energy and resources per day. Food, a bit of shelter, a bit of skin to you know, keep warm, whatever. Compared to my friend on the right in London last year, who is a kind of a parkour, we heard that earlier, this is a much bigger parkour, this is the Shard, the Shard building in London. He climbed up that illegally in the middle of the night and took this very cool picture. Mr. Shard climbing Londoner, as I suspect Mr. 
his equivalent or her equivalent in Helsinki or even in Rovaniemi, I don't know, in round numbers needs 300,000 kilocalories a day. The same kind of body and the same kind of general metabolism as the, the guy on the left, but because of civilization, our cities, our machines, and in particular, our economy, 60 times more resources than the kind of guy who came before. So that is, so to speak, where we've got to. If you know Icarus, who sort of flew up towards the sun until there came a moment when Icarus's feathered sort of clothes started to melt under the heat, we sort of got to that point at the moment. And as you see, and I don't need to go into all the sort of dramatic stories about things that can go wrong, we are in a difficult period. The economy is difficult. The global energy situation, food, all that stuff is complicated. So what do we do, having got to the top, the pinnacle of industrial civilization, the kind of apogee of what uh, some people call the thermo-industrial economy? We've done that. What do we do to kind of move to the next stage? So that's, I think, where I come to point two, which is the notion of, well, we have to get grounded somehow back in the world upon which we are part of it and not separated from it. So having spent rather a lot of time hallucinating or being a bit sort of misbelieving our own myth that we're separate from the Earth, we're kind of looking down on it, and when we need to dig things out of the Earth, we take them for our own. We build our machines or our buildings or our universities. If we have to reconnect, not about becoming hunter-gatherers, but that, how do we do that? That's where the notion of a bioregion, I think, as a kind of cultural shift, which you're seeing now in many parts of the world, becomes something which we can all agree. We may disagree about everything, about the economy, about politics, about education, about what we wear. Nobody is going to be against the health of their bioregion, the kind of the nature of their kind of where you are. We're all in favor of that. We don't want it to be sick, right? Therefore, if that is, so to speak, the starting point, that gives us a sort of playing field, a shared area of activity in which we can uh, discuss all our other differences, but where whatever else we decide to do, the health of the bioregion is something which we begin in lots of different ways to look after. So that we don't see the Earth as a kind of container of resources that we dig up to make machines with. We see the Earth as more like on the right, um, the, the garden on which we depend, and the healthier the garden, and the happier the garden, the happier and the healthier we are. So that is the shift um, we're talking about. And it's, a, it's not a small change, but I don't know how many people recognize this notion. Most designers have been struggling mightily to get away from designing just for machines for designing for the user, designing for man's needs rather than the needs of the system or the needs of technology. Great work precisely half as far as we need to go. The second half is all of us in designing in lots of different ways, we have to think about the well-being of all life and not just human life. Otherwise, we're going to uh, um, continue to go backwards. And that's why the bioregion is a rather, for me, and around the world, you're seeing lots of examples, neat way to think of that. So the economy is, so to speak, second. The bioregion is first. And I just want to finish by showing you there are, if you want to look about this notion, they, they exist on lots of different scales around the world. This is a kind of global map which some Swiss people have made. This is a map some uh, Austrians have made of a, an area of Europe in which they say, what are all the things happening in a bioregion? I don't want to go into this detail, but I just want to show you that people are thinking about it, but we, there's very little design work been happening to make these uh, stories about living systems and people more direct. And the missing element, and I think the thing that separates the kind of design strategy mind from the design grounded mind, is that we cannot just tell stories visually or make graphics or make films or YouTube videos. We have to physically get in touch with the soil in different ways to get really connected to our bioregion because we are human beings. We have brains in there, but we have bodies here and 90% of our total nervous system is connected, concerned with our bodies, not really with what our brains is. So if we want to think with our whole bodies and our whole beings, we have to be part and get our hands physically dirty, which is beginning to happen in different places. So if you remember that gigantic ship in Venice as the kind of the big, the small is, can be incredibly small. And the beauty of this kind of transition is that the small 
adds up to big when you look at a lot of it. This is in Iceland, where some friends of mine are trying to understand in what is a much more harsh environment, even here than in Lapland, what are the possible livelihoods that we could reconnect with in this very kind of rocky, tough place where we have these, the global aluminum industry, the global server farm industry coming to use our, our, our home as a kind of a glorified resource. How can we imagine uh, people subsisting on it? Start very small with the notion of the biotope, one rock, this is one rock with some lichen on it, and so this is happening in many parts of the world. People saying, what are the kind of natural living things in what looks to most people like a desert or a wilderness? There's always something alive there. How do we find what is alive? The lichen of different kinds. What are the herbs and the plants and the kind of things that have grown here despite all the kind of best and worst activities of man? The words of the bioregion as a herbarium. The, the plants as the kind, of, the kind of physical living map. And you put those two things together and you say, how could we in Iceland use our very hostile rocks, uh, some plants, uh, the energy that comes out of the ground, and farmers who have been here for generations with knowledge about this stuff, how could we combine those things together in a different concept of economy, which is where you're beginning to see speciality herbal products, speciality food, speciality small scale but high value, ultra, ultra high quality forms of uh, business activity, which could only exist when people looked at the tiniest, tiniest thing as the beginning of their journey. And this is uh, a friend of mine who's a writer in Iceland, says, and I'm sure it's the same here, is that we think that farmers seem to have disappeared from the narrative of what development agencies or designers think about. The people who are closest to the land and to the bioregion and to the ground are were and are farmers. Many of them are still there, but they've kind of been pushed off the land all over the world. So Andre Magnusson, who you may have heard of, has basically made one of his tasks to bring the names of all the farmers of Iceland into the attention of the planners and the development agencies so that they can be reminded that the farmers, as the original caretakers of the land, have not disappeared. They may have had to go and get a job in a design agency, but they're still there somewhere. So. Uh, I'm just trying to look at my, perfect. So you have the notion of a transition from an economy which devours the earth and must devour it more, otherwise it dies, which is kind of where we are now. You have a cultural shift in which people are saying, I can't relate to global things, but I can relate to where I live as the kind of natural sort of patch. My bioregion, that's something I can uh, connect with. I don't know what it means in terms of my job or my livelihood, but at least it's meaningful. Then what is the next step in connecting our daily life activities with these kind of very, very kind of different frames of reference? In other words, if I mentioned the metabolic rift in, the, in which for hundreds of years ago, because of modern life, we kind of lost contact and lost awareness with the living things upon which we depend, how do we reconnect people with the living systems? What kind of amazingly exotic things might we do to achieve that? Uh, this is where you start to see some people talking in very interesting theoretical terms, which doesn't, in my humble opinion, take us very far forward. So there are people who are doing PhDs in institutes and universities around the world about such things as social ecological systems. Uh, and there's a whole kind of cloud of very wonderful work happening, but it's, it basically operates 99% within the kind of world of universities and a certain number of policy makers and these kind of maps come out of that world. I think that we as design people, and I'm just with a small d and looking very broadly, should not become fixated about abstracts and PhD theses and policymakers. We should go and connect with, talk to, and become the friends and allies of the millions upon millions of people out there in the world who are today, just in order to survive, connecting with living systems in order to feed their children, to keep warm, to have somewhere to sleep. Um, in other words, the kind of general servicing of daily life needs. When you're poor in particular, you, use, you can rely less on very complicated, high technology, energy rich solutions. You have to go and find the kind of resources where you need. So social energy is out there 
but is horribly underestimated by the kind of the development models and the design models that we've all been taught. So that is where one of our starting points is people doing things without knowing the word innovation or design or development. They, don't, they think about running their businesses. I'm going to jump over that because I want it. So two examples, food. It's dangerous, I know, to talk about food just before lunch. But anyway, so the notion of food as an activity with lots and lots of different things going on. At the end of the day, food comes from living systems. In order not to starve, we human beings have to get food from somewhere uh, to keep our bodies going. And so there is the notion of the food shed or the food system, which is all the different activities that come together to get food from somewhere on the ground, uh, managed or otherwise, into our table. Here the problem is that the world has become horribly overcomplicated by the analysis of scientific flow. So food sheds, you can get PhDs all over the world studying the, the nutrient flows. This is in Italy. You can look at energy and kind of chemical inputs, which is um, a ch chart here. I think that for designers and for anybody who wants to connect out of the world of science into the world of, the reality, of reality and living systems, we need to make pictures like that of what you could call the actors in a food system. Can you read that, anybody? Can you read the words? So these are all the activities that take place in the general subject of a food system. Composting food waste, storing it, cleaning water, storing, cooking, transporting. So this was made in Denmark, actually, by some graduate students who said, well, in Aarhus, I said, what is the, I said, what is the food system of Aarhus look like as a kind of cloud of actors? So they made that picture. I said, OK, that's now a kind of classic abstract picture of words connected uh, in a rather complicated looking kind of diagram. And this is a very good example of how the world, the like world is so complicated. Systems are very abstract. How can we as individuals connect with that? The crucial story, and where's my pointer? And this is, I, I want to kind of emphasize this, that any system, however complicated, uh, contains clouds of relationships between people or energy and things. But the, and a system basically cont also contains interrelations between two nodes. So for any, if you think that, oh, that's too complicated, you could see the relationship between the people who sort food waste and the people who obtain it. That's a kind of direct relationship in which human beings, two human beings or two little groups of human beings, have a relationship. And one can imagine improving the quality of the interaction between those two people, two nodes in a complex system. So this is where the notion of small actions in a big context becomes so important and why it's so important that we don't become defeatist about the impossibility of changing the big picture. Because if we can look at the big story about what is in most places in the modern world a very inefficient way to get food from the field to the table. We don't have to try and have think very hard in a darkened room about the system in abstract. We look at individual bits and figure out how to improve little parts of the system using our design skills or just human skills. And that, changing the little bit, can change how the big one behaves because that's the basic knowledge that we've learned from science and from complexity thinking in the last 20 years is that small actions can change the big picture. So uh, until recently, said, oh, well, people wrote university documents about that. Now we as designers can say, OK, oh, which small actions would make the big picture change? And that becomes a kind of smart learning process by trying something small, going to talk to the waiters in a restaurant and ask them if they can help throw less food away in one restaurant. And then if that takes off or that becomes some kind of craze or cultural shift, then that little tiny action in one restaurant can begin to influence how the rest of the food, rest of the food system behaves. And that's exactly what's happening all over the world, is that people are looking at their immediate daily life environments and saying, this is rubbish. Why should I, why should I give my children food, which is either very obviously bad quality, or I don't know where it comes from, I don't know what's been put in it, um, that's something we all know about that story, the last uh, 10 to 15 years. 
And rather than saying, okay, I'm going to redesign the food system, no. They say, I'm going to open a community kitchen where me and my friends and my children can learn from our neighbors and our friends how to cook better with new kinds of ingredients. So the notion of, this is just an example from Los Angeles of a kind of kitchen incubator, which is a place, another word for school, where people just teach each other how to deal with food they don't know so much about. Here is Will Allen, some of you may have heard of, a guy who said, uh, I'm not going to design the, the sort of food systems of Americans' Rust Belt cities, but I am going to teach young uh, men from the ghettos how to do composting and how to grow food, because otherwise they're going to be, uh, take a different journey. So starting from five people, he's now got centers all over the Midwest in which young people from very, very urban contexts learn by doing how to do composting, how to grow food, how to kind of become a small-scale urban farmer, not because they care in abstract about sustainability, but because they wanted a choice between becoming criminalized and locked into jails or having a different path. Those actions begin from the very specific to change the behavior and the pattern and the dynamics of the food system as a whole. And now, as the kind of next generation comes, you say, okay, if there are all these interesting little experiments happening, and, and I'm sure you all know examples of that, people doing interesting projects about food, which for the most part are not very famous, or they're not in the press, or only a few people know about it, how could we improve our awareness of these experiments? How can we help them do their job better? How can we ourselves find out what's going on if we suddenly become interested? This is where you see people using, for example, food markets as what used to be just places to buy and sell vegetables, more and more as learning environments. So in this case, this is a new Amsterdam market in New York, which over the last five years has become like a kind of rather advanced global university of food projects because people go there from all over New York State with food, but also to give lessons to learn things, to exchange experiences. And so what is a kind of an exchange of food becomes also an exchange of knowledge. And it's 10, 100 times more dynamic than going to some college doing food studies where things have been rendered very abstract by the, the, the strange uh, peculiarities of the education system. And there I said, when I came to, uh, I wrote an email, I said, don't show me uh, charts, take me to the people who are in however small a way um, beginning to do experiments that reconnect people of this city with the living systems, the food flows upon which they depend. Fantastic uh, small family business, second generation, in which you have somebody who is uh, running a business, a shop, but in her running the business, she actually deals with 20, 25, 30 producers and farmers who provide her with the, uh, the, 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 the goods, but at the moment, they're totally invisible to you and to me, i.e. these farmers. Who are these farmers? Where are they? And so I said, so there's this fantastic kind of bag of, um, sea of, of, of grain, which is very high quality and is known to be, so I learned yesterday, the best grain in the whole of Lapland. But the woman who grows that, the farmer, she does not want to be a kind of celebrity farmer. She does not want to come to the city to go and give lessons about being farming. She doesn't even want to get involved in the stressful business of setting prices about, and so she charges too little for her grain. But I, my attitude to that is that when I hear the word shy and best grain, I think that is the kind of star of the show in this region. People like that who have the best quality uh, grain, but who don't want to become kind of evangelizers for what they do. Why should they? Why can't they be farmers? And then gets, we need to give them support on, for example, new forms of selling their grains to people. They, we need to invent new ways for them to set prices in a way that is fair so they have a more sustainable livelihood. There's a kind of all sorts of to-dos one could imagine in which the food shop is a kind of hub in the same way that, if you remember, um, New Amsterdam Market is a hub on a large scale for New York. Here, a f food shop is an example of a kind of interface between people and living systems, i.e. you who need grain and farmers and food and the land, in which one can imagine all sorts of ways of gently adding uh, experiences and connections um, in ways that have to work and be 
manageable by this woman who, and her business and the farmer and everybody else, but that is what designers have to do. They have to make these connections work better for people, not by kind of telling everybody what to do, but having collective discussions, and I'll finish on that in a moment. Then we went to this fabulous cafe where everything is for sale, including the furniture, and so when I met another group who said, well, we need hubs in Rovaniemi where people can meet and kind of learn about new ways of connecting with each other and providing new services. This already exists. It, does, it happens to be called a cafe rather than a hub. Um, and therefore, you have the notion in which we can just look at existing meeting places like the New Amsterdam market. Then we're going to go to people who are pioneering new, very kind of simple, very beautiful businesses without fancy kind of design inputs, but just a very high quality sensibility. I say, can we slowly use your space, your network, your food as a kind of tools for meeting? Well, I just leave that as a question. Then we went to Cafe 21. I gave them a hard time. So this is the coolest of these kind of food interfaces where they have these very beautiful cocktails and with berries. And I said, dear Cafe 21, tell me the story about your berries because I'm a tiny bit of a sort of food bore, as you can probably gather. And they said, well, they, yeah, we, I picked them in my mother's forest. Wow, I said, that is a great story. And is the, what is the kind of situation in the forest and how are the berries doing and how is your mother doing? And, and he looked at me as if I was a bit sad. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but the point, I, as a visitor to your cafe, would like to know the story about the berries in terms of them being a natural product that we need to do well. What would we need to do as visitors or as tourists or as people in your cafe for the berries and the woods and the forests and your mother's farm, all that stuff, to prosper in the future? I don't know, but why can't that cafe be one of the places where those conversations take place, not going to some course in a kind of university, but doing it, so to speak, where you're interacting with the food at this moment? Fiber is another thing. I, I need to speed up a bit because I know we're five minutes left. So food sheds is all the different people dealing with food, growing it, right, I hope I've made that clear. And it's not about designing the system in abstract, it's about looking at all the relationships between Cafe 21 and the berries, between the, the woman with the whole food shop and the farmer, and so on, making the little individual one-to-one -one connections work better, steadily, constantly improving those, the bits of the system, then the whole thing begins to evolve. The same can be done with fiber. So if you remember, uh, the agribusiness and the kind of shipping companies, they look at the, the, your part of the world, the, the Arctic, as a gigantic shipping lane and mine that they're going to dig up and turn into iPhones. Not much of an exaggeration. That's basically what's in their minds. And they think they could do that because, A, there's no alternative. That's what they have done, but it's not going to be so easy in the future. But anyway, why not think of uh, a large part of nature as the potential for a fiber shed in which lots of people doing things associated with growing, weaving, dyeing, etc., etc., begin to do that in a more self-conscious way. So in other words, anywhere where wild plants grow has the potential in one way or another to be a place where fiber bearing plants can also grow. I just copied the food um, system picture, but supposing all those people are actors, people doing things growing plants in a fiber shed, what would that mean in terms of seeing what the otherwise looks like a bit of desolate Finland or Lapland, which is too hostile for normal growing? If you see that as a potential fiber shed, what can you then begin to add in by way of different activities? And this is beginning to happen is the people, this is a, a map from London where they look at bits of Europe as um, possible kind of fiber shed uh, potential. And in America, they started to do it in a very, this is in North Carolina, they are designing fiber sheds in which groups of people who are doing all the fashion designers, recyclers, dyers, blah, 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 start to say, well, how are the relations between us working well or badly? What can we do to improve the way that we connect uh, the making and the growing and the, and, and the dyeing and so on? I'm not pretending that this is anything more than a tiny part of the global uh, textile industry, but as I keep repeating, tiny things are seeds of a different kind of plant, and if there are people in different parts of the world thinking of fiber sheds as a different way to think about where clothes come from or where textiles come from, those are the tiny seeds that we could say, oh, that's pretty 
that has promise. What would it mean for us to do that here in Lapland, to look at, at different sorts of hemp or different sorts of material? And that's what, indeed, you see happening. This is in France, where people are just connecting the different trades, the different crafts, the different farms, the different skills, and just figuring out ways to make them work together as an ecosystem. You can't design an ecosystem like you can design a car or a forest, uh, you know, a logging machine. You have to kind of see it as a kind of loose thing in which you help the little bits. The point being that it's not that we're starting from nothing. And where people once a generation ago would be doing natural dyeing as a kind of art project, now natural dyeing is becoming a more sustainable activity where there's lots of wild plants for a sustainable micro-enterprise, but where you have lots of micro-enterprises add up to a different kind of economy. So I hope I'm the story is clear. So then, then we go to a shop yesterday where there's recycled clothes, had a small argument about it, whether second-hand and vintage are the same thing. The point being that I know from one and a half days of in-depth research, there are people in lots of different parts of the city, never mind the Lapland itself, dealing with recycling, reselling, cl making clothes, swapping clothes, sharing clothes. For the most part, there are lots of people doing it as a kind of individuals, running a shop, running a business uh, on a very tiny scale. Therefore, for the most part, it's tough and it's difficult, particularly when you're fighting these big shopping malls and the kind of global brands who are doing their thing 50 yards down the street. The point being, but you have the elements. These are the kind of the molecules of a fiber system or a textile system or a clothing system. The next step is, given that these guys want to remain independent, don't want people telling them what to do, let alone people like me, how can they be helped to connect in ways that improve their business improves their networks, improves their knowledge, improves their sustainability. I don't know the answer, but that's why I'm saying that the tasks of design and development are to improve the connectivity between the people who are doing it, rather than thinking abstractly about what they need, make them the center of the story, which is why I promised to say that how to reconnect would be my kind of last five minutes. So. Everywhere I go, people say, look, we have a university with thousands of terribly well-informed scientists and researchers. Um, they are creating knowledge for society, and Rovaniemi is one of about 2,000 cities which wishes to be a knowledge-based city, like every other single city in the world, basically. I, it's fine. It's just that being, having a university full of researchers is a very modest value by itself until we figure out ways to connect the things that university people know to the things that society needs to know and the things that living system need to know. It's not an argument against it. I'm just saying that at the moment, nobody in universities thinks terribly much about that. You have people in research institutes who say, ah, well, if we can only turn this very technical language into the language that politicians and policymakers will understand, life would be better, which is sort of true. But this is the problem. Everybody is connecting around other bits of civilization so innovation connects science to business, marketing connects offers to consumers, design connects innovation, et cetera, et cetera. What's missing from the picture is somebody or a thing or a process or a state of mind called connecting, reconnecting with the living systems upon which all of the rest of these activities are dependent. How do we do that? How do we connect people in communities, the social energy I talked about, with the specialists. It's not that I'm suggesting, or I could waste my breath if I did so, that specialisms will disappear or that universities will just melt into thin air. That's not going to happen. But we need to be more proactive and more smart and more design-minded in finding ways for them to connect with each other in ways that create the value for both. How do we improve the way that decisions get made? so that we don't just have this very frustrating business of, I mean, I've had so many people complain about the government, the city hall, uh, the university ad administration. It's the same all over the world. They have these big organizations that are perceived to be in, not responsive, but that's because they can't respond. They're, they're bureaucracies and administrations. They're not knowledge or value creating individuals. So therefore, blaming bureaucracies is just a waste of effort. What we have to do is to figure out ways to re plumb the making of decisions, which people in government are very happy to be given that chance to do. They don't like being just accused of being useless all day long. They would like to be more hands-off and more supportive. If you 
do more of the kind of stuff with your feet and your hands in the soil. There are, of course, people making things like liquid democracy to help, but that's a bit of a diversion. So what I think design can do, given all this, is three things. Um, be talent spotters for the real world talent of the, I just sent like, literally one day and the, the development agency did a brilliant job of introducing me to some very inspiring individuals doing things that we need more of. And I know for a fact that in a week or a month one could find 10, 100 times more people either doing those things like because as their kind of life or that the things that we need are in people's evening or not in their kind of day job. We know that. So talent spot that, get them together. Figure out ways in a very practical sense to help them share time, space, money, knowledge, uh, markets. That's a kind of gigantic, that's service design if you want to give it a label. But how do we help these individuals and these communities and these farms and these groups and cities share what they're doing in a way that helps them? And thirdly, connecting them to each other. Not that we, as I don't know, policymakers or designers have to do it for them. We are doing it at their service. And this is where, just to kind of draw things to a close, it's happening everywhere. One of the um, phenomena of the world, and my job is to travel around and kind of keep an eye for sort of trends that, not trends, actual events, is that people are meeting in groups to discuss this kind of stuff everywhere you go. So you can tell me, if we have time before lunch, what your experiences are. But to be reasonably fair, me talking to you in this very formal way is not a typical thing nowadays. More it's the circle and the campfire, the tent, the town hall, the forest clearing meeting is cropping up all over the world. And it's just very powerful where people are saying, we don't actually know what we're trying to do here, but we do not want to wait for the government or for the town hall or for the experts from whatever to tell us what to do. We just have to discuss what we could do, and then you can actually get people to help you meet in a kind of mindful way. And these are just, this is the transition towns movement. Two, two and a half thousand towns within five year period have started to have these round table meetings in which people say, what are we going to do? What are the assets of our community? What are the tools and the kind of skills that we have? What do we lack? Where do we get what we lack? and on different scales. So this is the kind of the town hall meeting has been literally reinvented, not reinvented at all, just rediscovered everywhere from Canada to, to South Africa to London. This is in London, but they're happening all over the place. How do you get two, three, four hundred people to physically be in the same space, not to have a 10 hour meeting about the sort of budget, but just to share the space to breathe the same air for the sake of saying, okay, we are here as a community we are going to disagree about lots of things, but the one thing we do not disagree about is the necessity of, for our community to be proactive and getting things sorted out. This is in Brazil. This is in England. Somebody yesterday was telling me about hay bales and how this was a kind of low-cost form of meeting equipment. I think hay bales are fantastic because they are, you know, they're natural, they're cheap, and you can kind of sit on them or feed them to things afterwards. This is a kind of bunch of people at a festival. And so really, just to, to draw it to a conclusion, I'm describing very, very complicated things. Have meetings. Go and find out the people who are doing stuff and say, come to our shed, our place. Tell us what you are doing. Tell us what is uh, exciting you as an opportunity that you see just ahead, which can actually be amplified and repeated. Tell us about obstacles that are causing it difficult for you to move forward. Um, but in general, you be the kind of star of the show. We are not going to give you lectures about what you should do. Come and share your knowledge with us. And this is an example where designers can be very powerful and valuable servants of that process. So this is in France, but they're happening everywhere. It's called City Ecolab, where the, what we did was to make, get a large space and invite 46 projects from within 50 kilometers of that shed and say, come and tell us the story of your activity. We will help you make a little exhibition of what you do, if it's food or fish farming or bicycle couriers. So the design task was to help people who are bicycle couriers or fish farmers or, uh, I don't know, organic farmers, 
make a little display of their activity in such a way that they would then talk to each other with a kind of example of their real world life. And it's very, very powerful because you have real things that you can touch, people who are actually doing it rather than talking about it, and they get to talk to each other. It was fantastic. And then yesterday, I met some guys who are designing a kind of meeting machine. And I was so thrilled to see that it's round, lightweight, portable, has kind of theater and um, elements of joy and celebration included in it. I, it's slightly early days, so the guys, I think they were here before. I'm probably overselling this. But the notion is a meeting is something that can be designed as a thing, as an event, as an experience, as an attitude of mind. You can design the way that you meet so that people feel respected, that people feel they're going to be listened to, uh, people feel that it's for them and rather than for somebody else. So the design of meetings, the design of bringing groups together again, I think is pretty much the sum total of what I have to say about what we can all do. But the point is it can be designed well or badly. And the beauty of that is look around to where people are already doing this stuff and find ways to improve that, that experience. Uh, these are just examples of where, you know, in, in my travels, where people are just basically getting together to say, how can we do this better? How can we be the, look for the talent, look for the skills, meet, um, and share? Now, I know it's a slightly sensitive subject, the word Sweden, but I just wanted to end on that if you are interested uh, in this subject of sharing by meeting in the dreaded country whose name begins with S. There is this event in August uh, where some, a whole lot of people who are exploring the how you design meetings will be getting together um, for a few days on an island in the archipelago of the country whose name begins with S. So uh, that's all online. But other than that, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have something questions, we still have here John and uh, Juho and Johanna and Anne. So if you have questions, and uh, before those, I will tell you that if you want to eat lunch, here you can buy the lunch tickets from the info desk from here in Arctico. And the team group start at 1 p.m. And uh, uh, cold testi testing team group is here in the Polarium and uh, ice and snow constructions uh, team group is in the auditorium and uh, so, uh, sorry, in the Pilke, in the library of Pilke and the service design and tourism is in the auditorium in here in Arcticum. But now, if you have any questions, we have Sami who is going to run with microphone. So just ask. I can there behind is the question. But I believe you that you are hungry. I am. Okay, I guess this is more related to lapse. Sorry, than use your voice more, please. Okay. I think this is more related to lapset and Ponce. You were talking about that you customize your uh, products based on the markets, but more on based on the environment of the markets. Uh, do you also customize based on the users in those different markets or like the culture of those? Okay, based on Ponzo, we are, we are very, very close to the customer and we need to be able to design the product according to the customer needs. Uh, it's not so much the engineers. Engineers can do all kinds of stuff, but if it's not good for the for the customers, they will not buy those machines. So it's very very important. And we have we are a global company, and we try to act locally very very heavily. And and uh, see because it's it's totally different in Russia or in in um, uh, Southern uh, Europe or in in uh, Brazil. So we need to be very very local in in that sense. And also that's why we are designing for the customers and for the purpose that they have. We have global product families, so we are just, you know, uh, doing the different variations from the factory side so that uh, 
we have all the um, same options available for all the markets, so to speak. So it's possible to be very, very effective from the factory side. Okay, from our point of view, it's the same thing that children develop the same way around the world, and we have discovered that the same products sell everywhere when it comes to the children. So what it means that um, the difference globally is that if you go to mm, Korea, we sell bigger products because in one playground you have probably 100 children, while it's in here in Nordic countries you might have 10 or 20 p children at the same time. So the size varies rather than, than the products themselves. So we sell pretty much the same children's product. Then what varies now is the product groups that we sell. Probably uh, like the seniors' products are most pro popular right now in Spain. The senior products are not popular so much in, let's say, in France or Finland yet. But most likely they are going to be in, in the future. The ad adults' products are gaining popularity here in up north right now. And, and so we see the segments variations. But when you look at the children's products in general, we cannot see cultural variations that much. Thank you. I'm Sato Miettinen from University of Lapland. And <clears throat> I think I also have a more to, to Johanna and, and to Juho than, <clears throat> than to John's uh, presentation. I, something um, came to my mind when Johanna started the presentation saying that you don't have a design strategy. I somehow think that the design is not some kind of additional thing, but it's a core value of company. And I don't see it so dangerous if someone doesn't have a design strategy. Because I think now design or design thinking, it should not be something that a designer does. It should be something that the whole company is kind of uh, having this approach. And, and uh, not only a stra strategy can be a piece of paper. It doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's uh, applied. So I think there has been already a kind of shift, shift from, uh, from having some kind of addi additional functions uh, into more kind of core values. I don't know. I would like to ask from both of you, what do you think? Do you, think, do you share this idea that the design thinking is already kind of in the core value of the company or do we still need to do a lot of, uh, how do you say, evangelizing on design and the, and the use of it? I would mm, not say that it's a core value. It's a, a part of the core strategy of the company in that sense. The values are a little bit even deeper than, than, than the strategy itself. But the thing is that I, would, I, I, I still want to think in the future that we have to materialize all the, the somehow write it out as a strategy, part of the strategy, strategical thinking, because when it's written out, you still measure it too. Because this is what I'm lacking in our thinking, because it's like a medusa somewhere within the company. I still want to make it measurable. It's not measured. It, it doesn't, uh, we don't count it how it brings us money, how it's, because it's incorporated everywhere. So in order to um, justify it being there, it has to be measurable as well. Because we spend awful lot of money in, somewhat in design in every stage. So we, would be, we should be also measure, measure it. So that's why I think Anne is very right that you should have, in a way, also um, 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 a design strategy. But I would say that not in the, um, I would say, traditional sense. I fully agree. I think um, it's, it's in our everyday life, obviously. But the point is that we need to know exactly what we are doing. So the point is that we are making strategies in order to and write those out so we know that we are focusing in the right areas. Because the world is changing quite quickly all the time. The surroundings are different. And the requirements from the customers are different all the time. So we need to be focusing on the right things. We only have 85 people in R&D, which is for us is quite a bit. But we need to make those guys do the right things and not just think about in the morning that, oh, what should we be doing? So we need to have clear focus, 
clear uh, direction, and that's why we need strategies in order to make that happen. We need to be quite effective in these areas. What we do for different, well, not really, it's our everyday life, but when we are uh, doing new products and we are uh, doing new kinds of uh, uh, solutions, we, uh, for example, ICT, IT technology, we made a, um, a strategy in order to focus for the right things. And that was very, very important. Right now, we are not studying that. That's our, like, an everyday life. We have the projects ongoing, but we need to make the study. And if you want to call that as a strategy, it's, it's fine. So, but this is, this is how we work. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all brilliant speakers of, of this first part of the day. Uh, very inspiring. Um, but I would like to make a tiny shift from enterprises to communities because, John, I think what you were mostly talking about was actually about communities, big communities, small communities. Um, and I have a question for you. You end your, if, if I remember correctly, you end your book in the bubble, uh, which was, uh, which came out 2007, was it? Uh, with the words that, after all, everyone's a designer now, something like that. Now, uh, less than 10 years later, five, six years later, what do you say? Who is now a designer? Is this working? Sorry. Um, I did end on that uh, note, but the thing I regret, or the, if I ever get my next book written, it'll be, but to me, a designer is not somebody who has to be responsible for producing things. That's the basic um, death wish we have as a culture, is that we have to produce and produce and produce. And I tried to suggest in that book, and also in my work 100% now, ways in which designers can do other things than be just part of the productive economy. Um, and that's why being at the helping to communities to manage their territory, their social affairs, their health, their housing, in new ways to do not uh, depend on these like tremendously wasteful flows of resources. It's a gigantic re reorganization of everything. So that's why um, I'm trying to always talk about examples of where designers are working with communities. But as you say very sensibly, communities can be anything from two people to two million people. It, the scale is pretty flexible. Thank you. Um, I am Marketa Niemela from VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. And I very much like your idea about reconnecting the society to nature. But how about technology? What is your opinion? Is it taking us closer or further from the nature? And is there any way or means that technology could take us to closer to nature? I think that t I absolutely am in favor of technology being used to help us reconnect with nature. We ha I have no idea what the, I know lots of little examples of how we can understand what is happening in natural systems better by using sensors and different way devices. We can absolutely look at ways of restoring uh, landscapes using technological aids. I'm not suggesting um, that everybody's gonna suddenly use totally unmotorized equipment. It's to do with, what we have to do is think holistically about, that's why I use this word bioregion so much as the region as a living system in which we all share, and saying what are the different ways in which we can increase the health of that bioregion? The land, the water, uh, the air, uh, the, the paved surfaces, the built bits and the unbit, and that's a, like a huge list of small actions that people can take as individuals or communities. And I think that the, it's not for or against technology, it's just, Somebody has to say, is this yes or no going to increase the health of our bioregion? And that's the question that has to be asked. So with Ponce, with all due respect, it always reminds me when I hear that kind of presentation of Avatar. So your machines are the, do you know Avatar, the movie? So in Avatar, it's like a kind of the, the machines that come attack the kind of the fawns and the kind of blue people in the forest don't appear to have intelligence. That's what they don't. It's how the machines are used that is crucial. So it's not, is technology in forestry good or bad? It is who is managing, who is responsible for the health of the forest on a large scale through time. And that sadly is missing because you have people who make machines, people like Ikea who buy wood, you have governments that kind of, there's a missing 
person or a missing bit of the governance called who looks after the health of the land whilst we all do our individual bits. And that's the biggest challenge we all have to face. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much this morning session and have a nice lunch and have a nice team groups and we see you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock in here in Polarium. Thank you very much. Why?